please open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We will begin reading at verse 9, and we will read through verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 at verse 9. We read these words from the Apostle. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the word, the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. As the Thessalonians welcomed the Word of God into their midst, may we too welcome the Word of God this morning. I have opened with this text because I believe it explains what we are talking about, and I also believe it explains why we are talking about what we are talking about. It's very clear in these opening verses that Paul's relationship with the church at Thessalonia was a a strong relationship, a good relationship. We don't read of those tensions that Paul experienced with other congregations that as we read between the lines, we can sense the friction that is there between apostle and the congregation. As Paul remembers his time with the Thessalonians, he's overjoyed, overwhelmed with fond memories of how he proclaimed the gospel to them, and they welcomed it into their lives. We read in Acts of Paul's stay there in Thessalonia. We read that many devout Greeks came to Christ And as Luke says in a very clever way, and not a few of the noble women as well. This was a church that well received Paul. Of course, the city did not receive him as well, and so Paul finds himself uninvited from the city itself, and he needs to move on as he so often did. But they're left behind And that city was a testimony to the power of the gospel. Would you look with me again at verse 13 just to see these clauses that are there? We see what Paul did while he was there. He labored to do one thing, and that was proclaim the gospel. He labored to do one thing, and that was simply to preach the Word of God. And it's very curious, the response, isn't it? It's not just that they received it. The idea is that they they welcomed it into their home. They welcomed it as you would welcome a guest of some noble stature. It was in March of last year that my family and I were down here escaping what was a very brutal winter in Pennsylvania last year. That had nothing to do with my decision to accept the position (laughs) to move my family to the palm trees of Central Florida. But we were sitting there, and it was before the national conference, and we had ordered a pizza for lunch, 
And we looked over, and there, wandering around, looking rather haggard and famished, was none other than Dr. Sinclair Ferguson. And so we welcomed him to our table to join us for a slice of pizza. And he ate pizza with us, and I think he drank soda, and he talked to my kids, and we welcomed him as a guest. And this is how the Thessalonians received the Word of God. But Paul makes it very clear what's going on here. This is not the Word of men. This is an age in the Greco-Roman world where schools of philosophy were popping up and philosophers would blow into town and they would find themselves on the steps of the courthouse or in some center marketplace and they would promulgate some new idea. They would be skilled rhetoricians. They had studied the rules of rhetoric from Aristotle. They knew how, as we say in journalist terms, to have a hook at the beginning. And they would walk someone through an argument and then, oh, wait for the closer, here it comes. And the audience would be wowed by their erudition and their rhetoric. This is not what Paul did. This is not the word of men. This is the word of God. That's what it really is. When we put on this conference or decided to put on this conference, Chris Larson and I thought we will be successful if we have 120 people. And look at you. You are here because you know that the one thing that matters is the Word of God. You can come back 100 years from now And if we're still talking about the Word of God, it will be meaningful. It will be the most meaningful thing we could be talking about. And 2017 is coming up. It's a very exciting anniversary year. What if the Lord tarries another 500 years? And these institutions that God has raised up and blessed are still proclaiming the Word of God. Do you know, 500 years, while we're commuting back and forth to the moon, the Word of God will still be the most powerful message on the face of the earth. Because it is not the Word of men. Do you want to know what this really is? This holy book It is the Word of God. We'll talk about him in a moment. Well, let's talk about him now. Peter Martyr Vermigli. We don't hear enough about him as a reformer. He's an Italian. He was trained at the best of Italian academies in Aristotelian logic and rhetoric. Made his way through the ranks of the priesthood, and then he converted God opened his eyes to the beauty and the truth of the Reformed doctrine, and he became a child of God. And he fled Italy, and he found himself in Zurich. And for a brief time, he had a post at Oxford, and then he was back at Zurich. He was engaged in all sorts of debates over the authority of the Scripture. And you know what did it for Vermigli? Two words. Dominus. Dixit, which being translated in English is four words. Thus says the Lord. As the end of the discussion of the question of authority. Dominus Dixit. Thus says the Lord. That is what we are talking about. We are talking about the Bible as the Word of God. And we will develop that doctrine in a moment, as that leads us to speak of the authority of God. 
as it leads us to speak of the inspiration of Scripture and the only logical conclusion from that is inerrancy. We will talk about that in a moment, but this is what we are talking about. But why are we talking about this? And that's the last clause in verse 13. Because it is the Word of God, it is powerful. It is effective. It is a tool that's up for the task. Or we could just simply say, it works. And it is at work in you. This is the idea in the Latin word, and it ties into how a classical view of education of formatio or formation. We see the beautiful rock formations, and we realize that how they were formed was intense pressure exerted upon them by an external force. The beauty of a diamond, of external pressure, forming it and shaping it. All around you, in this medieval cathedral, do me a favor at the break time and step outside and look across the pond and you'll see a building over there and you'll see some windows in that building. One of those windows is my office. And I do believe I have the best view in the entire world because I look across the pond, and every time I do, I'm thankful to Dr. Sproul for building a cathedral in Sanford, Florida. Do you see the Luther Rose behind me? A carpenter had to take the chisel and exert pressure on the object to create that beautiful Luther rose that is immediately behind me. And that's what the Word of God does. It digs in, and it works, and it grinds, and it sands off all of those rough edges, and it shapes us, and it matures us, and it sanctifies us, and it purifies us, and it perfects us. The doctrine of the Word of God is of ultimate importance because of what the Word of God does, and because it's the only thing that does it. Why are we talking about inerrancy? Why are we talking about the unadulterated authority of the Word of God? Because It's the only thing that works. The prophet Isaiah said it. That as the dew and the rains go out, and as they fall across the fields, and the tilled soil yields forth its crop, so the word of God goes out. And it will not return with an empty hand but it will return with results. It will accomplish the purpose that the Word of God is set to do. And the purpose for every one of us in this room is to be taken by the hand of our dear Savior and brought in the white robes of His righteousness before the Father and brought into the perfection that God has designed for us. Jesus said it very simply, sanctify them, purify them, perfect them, sanctify them through Thy Word. Thy Word is truth. Roughly a hundred years ago, Herman Bovink, 
was appointed the rector of theology at the Free University of Amsterdam by the then president, Abraham Kuyper. And Bavink gave in his address to mark the occasion a lecture he entitled Modernism and Orthodoxy. Of course, he gave it in Dutch. If only Dr. Godfrey were here. In it, Bavink talks about the modern world that the early 20th century was entering into. He calls it a world altogether different from that of our ancestors. He goes on to say, we do not know either what greater changes still lie in store. We are likely not at the end, but at the beginning of developments. We do not know what triumphs in science and technology still await, what new conditions these will bring about in society and state. Still, there is reason to expect wonderful things. God is busy doing great things in these days. And then he proceeds in that address to say how Some, affected by this modern world, are asking the entirely wrong question. Those who are wowed by these developments in science and technology, those who are wowed by the great, phenomenal advancements at the turn of the century, as you compare the change, the rapidity of change in the modern world, the change in the previous centuries was glacial by comparison. And in this whirlwind of change, the modernist asked the wrong question. Is this ancient book still of any value in the modern world? Have we not progressed beyond it? And so Bavink warned of the temptation to jettison orthodoxy and the swirl of modernity. In 1912, he walked right in to the lion's den, and he gave a lecture at what was literally called the Convention of Modernist Theologians. And in that lecture, he recalls his student days, his doctoral student days at the University of Leiden, and he says, I went there and I was given stones for bread. This was a theological faculty that had long since sold its birthright. And he saw it for all its vapid shallowness that liberalism truly is. He says this modernist credo to reduce the great realities of the Christian faith to mere clangs and to mere symbols must be resisted. And then Bavink says this, these great realities of the Christian faith remain realities. The birth, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ is not a symbol of anything. It is real. Were I to give them up, Bavink says, were I to give them up, I would lose myself. And then I said, that can't be true. These realities are worth more. They are real as facts. They are more real as facts than any of the supposed difficulties in Scripture. I am therefore not bound by any tradition. Now, what he's saying there is that the modernist is saying that the tradition of the church had invented the idea of the authority of Scripture. Scripture never asks that of us to ascribe to it. That's what he means by not because of that tradition. And this is what he says, rather by that which is for me personally 
in the depth of my soul. Listen to this great Dutch theologian, Bavink. This is what he says. These realities are the life of my life, the very salvation of my soul. Not only was Bavink facing this problem in the Netherlands, we were facing this problem in America. We call it the modernist, fundamentalist, modernist controversy. And one of the figures to emerge out of that had a great tutor, B.B. Warfield. And the pupil of Warfield was none other than Machen. And one of my favorite texts of Machen is a little piece published in all things McCall's Magazine. That's right, you heard me. McCall's, the woman's magazine, J. Gresham Machen published an article in that magazine in 1931, and it was entitled, Of Skyscrapers and Cathedrals. He had just visited New York City. He loved to go to New York City. His favorite tailor was in New York City at the Brooks Brothers in New York City. I just heard an amen from our Baptist in the crowd. (laughs) He would ride the subway or the uh, elevated cars it was at that time. He would take in a play. He would get fitted for a new suit, all the while skipping his afternoon Hebrew classes where he should be at Princeton Seminary as a student. Now he's a professor there, and in 1931, he travels to the brand newly minted Empire State Building. And the thrill of the day was to hop into the elevator and go all the way to the top. And Machen did that. And it gave him a moment for reflection. Oh, the achievements of the modern world. Look at what we have done. We can lift the body. But we do nothing for the soul. And then he remembers visiting Europe and the grand cathedrals. If only he had come to Sanford, Florida. And he walks into the cathedrals and immediately his eyes are lifted upward. And he's not overwhelmed by the engineering technology of human beings. He's overwhelmed by the grandeur of our God. And he says, oh, that God would bring to us once again a longing, a desire for the realities of the truth of his word. To not be enticed by the brass ring of progress. that the solution is within us. The lie of modernity. The seduction of modernity. But that we would submit. His last words are simply this. May God send to the world a humble heart finding in His worship the highest use of all knowledge and power. That's the answer to the modern world. We skip ahead to the 1970s, and we find that we are locked in the same debates. Those within the conservative theological camp are saying, maybe Moses didn't write the Pentateuch, after all. And maybe this is the work of man. It is man's expression of his reaching up to God put into Scripture. It is aspirational, not inspirational. And so we'll hear about this in the next session. But a select group of men gathered and began working on a statement. And then they invited a few hundred of their friends to come to Chicago 
And they spent a few days working over that statement, and they signed it, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. And we'll talk about this, but that statement sustained a generation in its fight against the challenge to inerrancy. It was in the 1980s that the Southern Baptists stole back their denomination. And I think you can draw a straight line from the Chicago Statement to that phenomenon of church history. This was a statement that sustained a generation. It was 10 years ago that a book was published that was a bit of a controversial book. It was entitled Inspiration and Incarnation. And that book looked at the difficulties in the Old Testament and began raising the question of the position of the Chicago Statement of Inerrancy. This in the 2010s or 2000 zeros is a new challenge. It's coming from a new philosophical position. We can see the modernist impulse at work back in the 1910s that Bavink and Machen and others were challenging. But now we have this postmodern ethos in which we live, and one of the theses sort of running through that book is that the Bible is contextual. And a great postmodern word, situatedness. Philosophers of history will tell us that in the ancient and medieval world, they were fixated on being. And so most of the philosophers pour their energies into discussions of being. As we move into the modern world, the question became knowledge. And so Descartes and Locke and Hume and Berkeley, they all contributed and wrestled and debated knowledge. And now, in the 21st century, we have moved to language and interpretation. Because everything is contextual. And so scholars have engaged this book, Inspiration and Inerrancy. A friend of ours, Dr. Greg Beale, wrote a book largely in response to that called The Erosion of Inerrancy. And they engage that book in answering the challenges regarding the biblical difficulties, but there is one sentence in that book that I find perhaps the most alarming, and it's simply this. The Bible sets trajectories, not rules. We know as we read wisdom books, we know that in the poets that we see that wisdom calls for us to apply certain of the poetic book wisdom in some situations and and others not. Sometimes the author of Proverbs tells us to seek counsel. Other times he says there's folly in counsel. We know that wisdom calls upon us to analyze the situation. But in this book, the argument is made that the law itself is contextual. That in the Pentateuch, the law is given different ways indicating to Israel, to Israel, that Israel is to figure out how it applies and how they should interpret it. And so the conclusion for us as we read the Bible is that the Bible does not give us rules. The Bible sets trajectories. The erosion of inerrancy has everything to do with that last clause in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. That this work that the Bible does in us is predicated upon one thing. It is the Word of God. One of the challenges to inerrancy goes something like this. The Bible never demands that of itself. And by the way, as we look through church history, inerrancy is not demanded either. It is an invention of the Princetonians and of people like Machen. 
And given the difficulties that are found in Scripture, it's not a helpful doctrine. And also, given the fact of contextualization, we can be a bit more flexible and recognize that the Bible is not static, but dynamic. And so we don't need inerrancy. The answer to that is all bound up in this idea of authority. And it's not just an invention of the Princetonians. It's a vein that runs all through church history. In fact, we can find this back in Augustine. There's a wonderful letter of Augustine, if you'd like to look it up. It is Epistle 28. In Epistle 28, Augustine is dealing with helping a fellow bishop engage the heretics that are encroaching upon his church in his region. And this is what Augustine says, admit even a single well-meant falsehood into such an exalted authority, into the Bible, and there will not be left a single section of those books which, if appearing to anyone to present difficulties from the point of view of practice or to be hard to believe from the point of view of doctrine, do you see that? Hard for us to practice this, hard for us to bring ourselves to submit to this, or hard for us to accept this teaching. If we do that, he says, nothing will escape from being classified as the deliberate tact of an author who was lying. Admit even a single falsehood into Scripture, and it's the proverbial house of cards. Nothing is off limits. He goes on to say, speak of the authority of unadulterated truth, and then he says this, an effort must be made to bring to knowledge of the sacred Scripture a man who will have such a reverent and truthful opinion of the holy books that he would refuse to find delight and a well-meant falsehood anywhere in them and would rather pass over what he does not understand than prefer his own intelligence to their truth. When we no longer stand under Scripture, but we stand over Scripture, do you see what we're doing? We're submitting Scripture to our sense of what should be and our sense of what is truth. For indeed, when such a person, when he expresses such a preference, he demands credence for himself and attempts to destroy our confidence in the authority of the Holy Scriptures. Whether it's credence for himself or credence for ourselves as our group in our contextual moment, if we think we know better than the Word of God, do you understand what we are saying? If we think this is not the inerrant, fully truthful of the Word of God, do you understand what you are saying? You're saying the Word of God submits to me. We all know Isaiah chapter 6, don't we? And here we are in front of a holy God. And what does mortal man have at his disposal? Absolutely nothing but to fall on his face and say, Lord, I'm undone. And so we come to a holy word. And what option do we have but to fall on our face and say, we submit. We submit. Our challenges are a bit different in our day than they were in the past. Our new crisis is also our old crisis. But this is the Word of God. It is perfect and pure. It is holy and good. It is certain and true. We must humbly submit to it. We must, like the Apostle Paul, preach it. And we must, like the Thessalonians, welcome it. And it is this Word of God that is at work in us. May it be so. 
May it be so. Father God, we are but faithless servants, and we doubt, and we are so easily swayed, even by the pressures of our age. It is Your Spirit who opened our eyes to the truthfulness of Your Word, and may Your Spirit continue to guide us in Your truth so that we may be your faithful servants, reading and living and loving your holy and true word. Amen.